Hi, this is Matt Reisinger with Reisinger Homes. Welcome to my video blog dedicated to building science and fine craftsmanship. I've got a great topic for you today and I actually have a guest speaker for my blog. With me is my friend Christoph. Christoph, how are you today? I'm doing well, Matt. Thank you for joining us. Hey, Christoph has given this presentation a couple of times and uh, if you've been a follower of my blog, you know that I'm a huge HVAC geek. And uh, here's the king of all HVAC geeks <laughs> who's about to talk to you right now, Christoph. He does all my energy modeling and testing and HVAC design great guy so Christoph take it all right thank you Matt okay everyone here we go we're gonna be talking about VRF mechanical systems today and uh, just to get the preliminaries out of the way that acronym VRF it stands for variable refrigerant flow and in a few minutes you'll know what that means Ah, the uh, obligatory introduction so I'm a building science consultant here in Austin Texas we do uh, all of Matt's high-performance mechanical design we do energy modeling we do his performance testing and today would be part of the education and outreach work we do for homeowners, architects, and builders. All right, so we got four topics. We're going to be covering the first one on this video, and then uh, right away we're going to go into the second one, part load conditions. And numbers three and four, I'm doing a little more product research locally here, and I'll be talking to you about the hardware in separate installments of this. Okay, first a quick disclaimer. None of these companies that you're going to hear about are uh, supporting this video and my speaking about them does not constitute an implicit endorsement. I'm really pro this technology. Uh, there's lots of companies that are doing it. I would like to add if any of these companies do want to support this seminar, my office uh, contact information appears at the end. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so what is VRF? stands for Variable Refrigerant Flow. And it's an established heating and cooling technology, both for commercial and residential applications. And it provides for variable capacity operation. Quick overview of what variable capacity is. You see that accelerator pedal there? That is how you vary the capacity of your engine. So if we only had a key, we would not have variable capacity for our cars. If our car was floored and we use a key, no variable capacity, but we have accelerators. So we'll be talking about why that's important coming up. As you can see here on this slide, we show three manufacturers of VRF equipment that are selling uh, locally and across the nation. On the left, Mitsubishi, LG in the center, and Daikin on the right. <clears throat> Excuse me, there's a slew of others in this product category um, coming on strong. It is a technology that is air source heat pump. It completely gets rid of all the uh, performance issues that used to give heat pumps a black eye in terms of heating mode. Cooling performance is tremendous, very low energy use. We'll be talking about the performance benefits more, especially in installments three and four of this video. On the, this is the outdoor units. These things are extremely quiet, durable, uh, very reliable. Uh, indoor unit side, we can see here, this represents a whole new palette of colors for architects and builders to deliver conditioned air to the building. On the right we have your conventional upflow type system or upflow type configuration, excuse me. Air comes in the bottom, goes out the top. It's a big rectangular box with refrigerant lines, condensate lines, and electric. Um, we can see some of the space mounted units there on the top left. At the bottom on the left there we see one that's actually quite interesting. It's called a concealed ducted unit. It's got the form factor of something like four pizza boxes stacked up and the airflow is horizontal through those. Full ducted capability can serve a whole house. Uh, we'll be talking more about that in slide three and four. This product sector of VRF is just blowing up. It is where uh, every leading manu manufacturer in North America is starting to go. Carrier, Ream, Train, Lennox, they're all introducing VRF into their product lines. So we can see here on this slide, it's just a bit of a cartoon showing some of the dynamism uh, the names in VRF and they're consolidating, they're buying each other, they're working together. They're really, uh, it's very quite clear in the industry that this is the direction that the technology is moving towards variable capacity equipment. Uh, here's another graphic of that. The countries in gray are countries that have already adopted VRF for most of their heating and cooling needs and you can see uh, the United States is catching up now. All right, that was your introduction. Now we're going to do a little bit of perspective. Um, perspective is important, I believe, because this is a big decision, the mechanical equipment for your building. 
and you want to be basing it on facts and on an understanding rather than just trusting someone to give you the right opinion and give you the right information. So that's what I really want to do with, with this information is to help you understand why this is important, not just trust me, it's important, go do it. So quick perspective on where we're going with the built environment. Uh, about 100 years ago, we had very simple structures and very simple heating and cooling systems, uh, fireplace for heating, windows for cooling. And our comfort expectations have changed. We're sort of in the middle there, maybe moving to the right. Homes, assemblies, it's getting more complicated. I think those of us in the industry, probably those of you listening to this, know that the number of products and systems and assemblies are just proliferating and it's hard to keep track. We are moving back toward simplicity. I'm confident of that. We're moving back toward really good enclosures, carefully designed, and then um, relatively simple suite of products to condition the space where a lot of the complexity is happening behind the scenes. Okay, so we're jumping right in now to changes, changes in performance. That's an Aries K car on the left, 1980s, that, that uh, picture on the upper with the man's face. That was the chairman of Chrysler, and he saved Chrysler from bankruptcy by introducing that car. That car, by today's standards, like compared to that Audi down the lower right, that K car would not meet anyone's performance expectations, <laughs> to put it mildly. Mm -hmm. I used to ride around in those with my hockey team. We could barely make it 40 miles an hour up some hills. Cars have changed tremendously in 30 years. Homes, less so. The rapid change in performance and the technological sophistication of of cars is now being echoed in homes. Let's take a quick look at uh, how things can change in 50 years. 50 years of trains, you can see quite a big transition, but they went farther. Same thing with planes, that's pretty amazing, 50 years from that to that. We were quite a bit ahead of that now. 50 years of air conditioning. So you can see that the, the air conditioner on the right, that's considered the pinnacle of where we are. The perspective is it's moving somewhere else. It's, the technology is going to evolve, and it already has in some ways, and that's what we're talking about today with VRF. One last example of technology evolving, carburetors. I actually used to have a Chevy van with a Holley on it, always messing with it, always rebuilding it. Carburetors went away. Fuel injection systems replaced them, not because carburetors didn't work, but because for the role they served, fuel injection equipment gave better performance, better control. So similarly, air conditioning equipment is going to evolve. Here's some examples of where it's going to go. Desiccant-based evaporative cooling, no compressor in these things, just fans. Farther out, there's some uh, quantum effect devices, and there's already some solid-state uh, electric heating and cooling devices for pretty extreme environment applications. All right, another perspective here is on our industry. One of our drivers is money. You're buying a house, you're thinking about money. You're building a house, you're thinking about money. Designing a house, thinking about money. That's not a bad thing. It just matters. It's just a matter of what you're focusing, focusing on. Excuse me. Over the last 30, 40 years, I think it's safe to say that the process has been really given a lot of scrutiny. Scrutiny. Uh, people really paying attention to how to build homes. Recently, last 10 years or so, the result of that process is getting more scrutiny. And this is redefining what we call normal. Um, you know, frankly, what we call a high-performance home now, like the homes that Matt's building, these are very comfortable homes. They're going to last a long time. The indoor air quality is going to be extremely high. They're going to be very energy efficient. This is becoming the new normal. That cycle on the right, houses get better, people expect them to be better. Because people expect them to be better, the market differentiates itself by making them even better. So the cycle just goes around and around and around. Okay, so that's my perspective on the industry. Now let's talk a little bit about building science. So I used to be a physicist. I used to work for a couple universities, and now I build, or then I started building houses, and now I uh, talk about building houses, essentially. When you apply the laws of physics to the built environment, you come out with a strategy. The strategy is, well, let me step back. What do you want? You want, I'm going to go back. You want high performance, comfort, being the, the main ingredient there. So if I want comfort, I want to separate the outdoor environment from the indoor environment, and I want to control the exchange. Heat, air, and moisture are the three ingredients that we want to control the exchange across the boundary. So to do this, we use an invention called a building envelope. This is a functional assembly. It's not a recent invention. It's 
it's an environmental separator. We're trying to keep the outside out, keep the inside in, and control the exchange. So this also might be new, might not be new to many of you. The concept of control layers. We're controlling heat, air, and moisture flow through the envelope, and that's what we're seeing here. Heat, air, and moisture flow. Oh, and I misnumbered it. So moisture is separated into bulk water, number one, and water vapor, which should be number three there across the boundary. So those boundaries leak, though, and sometimes tragically, right? This is New Orleans. The goal of that levy was to keep the outside out, the inside in, and control the exchange. Let's talk about what happens on control layers when they fail. What are the ingredients? So control layers fail when all three of these are present. Something to leak, an opening in the control layer, and a driving force to, to move across the, uh, across the control layer. So something to leak, that's pretty easy. We build our homes outside, there's weather outside. And often, it's not exactly the same conditions you'd want inside. So that's fairly much a given, something to leak. Are there holes, are there openings in our control layer? Well, the answer is yes, we're working on those as an industry. You can see some holes there, uh, ceiling plane holes, holes in the rain control layer up above in the Tyvek, um, holes under the tub, and then if you put something fluffy in there, it's not sealing the hole, just to point that out. So, something to leak, it's present, openings are present, driving forces are always present. I want to touch briefly on the four types of downhill. These are the forces that drive heat, air, and moisture across buildings, building control layers. Number one is gravity. We know rain falls downhill, groundwater goes downhill. We make sure that, the gra that gravity does not drive rain into our buildings. Similarly, there's other versions of downhill. And they seem to be uh, trickier to understand, but really it's very similar concept. Temperature goes from high to low. You see that uh, color-coded mountain, that topo map down the lower right? Downhill is from red to purple. So heat flows downhill. If that was a temperature map, if it was a pressure map, pressures would equalize by moving from high to low. Same thing with diffusion. Areas of high water vapor concentration will move to low water vapor concentration. So these are the driving forces. Again, they are always present. So. Control layers are always going to leak. They're always going to leak a little bit. We're not building the space shuttle here. So another one is building science perspective on what do we got here. We have one functional system. We have a building and an air conditioning system. It's made up of different components, but it has one goal. It's to deliver performance, comfort, durability, energy efficiency. So we've talked about the driving forces. Um, we've talked about what leaks in. So why are we focusing on VRF? It's because of the changes that are happening in the building envelopes. And I've highlighted three today, energy codes, moisture resilience, and envelope design, how we're constructing them. So energy codes, I think we all know this, energy codes are changing. Uh, energy use is going down, down, down from back where it was in the 70s and 80s. And it's possible that moisture resilience is following this trend, unless we're very careful. So we're also changing the ability of our buildings to dry out. So back in the 30s, 40s, and 50s, we had a lot of heat in the summertime and a lot of air movement through our building assemblies. Down here in Austin, Texas, this meant we had a tremendous ability for our buildings to tolerate moisture and to dry out. With modern materials, different types of insulation and engineered wood products, we no longer have the ability to, uh, for our buildings to store water and re-release it when drying conditions exist. This is called hygric buffer capacity. And it's gone down, depending on your construction choice, choices tenfold in the last uh, 50, 60 years. Changes to the building envelopes. This is one that we're probably all familiar with. Uh, we gift wrap our buildings. That's starting to evolve. Um, Multi-story building with Tyvek on it, we see fewer and fewer of those. We're seeing, in fact, a tremendous proliferation in the products in this sector. And Matt and I are going to be talking about this at some upcoming conferences. Um, with apologies to Crosby, Stills, and Nash, there's something happening here. right? We're seeing all kinds of new products and assemblies. Um, zip wall, some Tremco, fluid applied. I'm not going to list them all, but we, we, just, we know that there's a lot. So what it is is very clear. 
So we're seeing all these products come out. Why? Why is this? Hey, there's Matt. Delta Dry there. We have Dimple Matt up top. So there's something happening here. What it is is very clear. What's it about? It's about control, right? This, all these products used to be there on that bullet point list. Used to be you could just pay attention to house wraps. And now just thinking about your enclosure, the, out, the control layers on your enclosure, there's so many different products. And we'll go into that later. I do want to point out this last perspective slide here. Peril of incremental change. We, I think we all know the parable about the frog and the water getting gradually hot. We have been seeing incremental change in these products that we've been talking about over the years on the enclosure side. And on the mechanical side, we need to adjust what we're doing. And so we'll be talking about that coming up in part two.